My name is Paul DiMarzio. I am the uh, EEA Director of Community. And what that means is this kind of stuff, all right? I was hired by the EEA back in August to start opening dialogues with all the different uh, uh, con communities that we represent, you guys being one of them. Um, yes, yeah, and so I started in August. It means I'm a bit of an Ethereum rookie, um, but not a rookie to blockchain. I spent a couple years at Digital Asset working on their stuff, their DAML smart programming language and, and their platform. And then prior to that, I was with IBM, you know, doing IBM stuff. Uh, and now I, I decided that it was time to get where the action is, right? Where, where all the good developers, the best developers are the Ethereum community, so I'm really glad to be joining you guys and I hope to have a lot of dialogue with you. So the reason we're having this session today is because you may have heard over the summer, you know, this, this weird thing where the EF and the EEA have joined forces together and, and I is on our board and, you know, what, what the heck does all of that mean? Um, so we're here to talk through that. Um, the truth is we don't have all the answers ourselves yet and that's why we're here with you guys because we want to hear what you have to say and how you'd like to see this thing move forward. It's very important to us to get your feedback, so that's what we're gonna do today. And uh, as my friend John Wolpert here likes to, to call it, we're gonna talk about the magic bus, Ethereum mainnet running business. Let's see how that works out. <laughs> so I'm really happy to be joined by all these esteemed folks sitting in the front here. Um, I'm, co I'm, I'm joined by Ron Resnick, who's my uh, executive director. There's me, I just introduced myself. You know, Hudson from the EF, Jamie from the Magicians, Lane from the Cat Herders. We've all been working together a little bit to, to figure out what this session's gonna be. <coughs> Annette's been helping, John's been helping. Tim doesn't wanna sit up front, but Tim's been helping a lot back there as well. I appreciate all your efforts. <laughs> You're not allowed up here. Yeah, we, we'll just make Tim answer all the questions. Um, so what we thought we'd want to do is, you know, give, first give you guys some information. Um, so talk through, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna have introductions. All my friends up here are gonna say who they are, what they do, why they're here. I'm gonna come back and talk a little bit about the EEA to give you a feel for what we're all about and why we're interested in the main net these days and how we're thinking about going about that. Um, then the community is going to give their view. So we're going to hear again from the EF, the magicians, and the cat herders to kind of, you know, show us what they're thinking about this stuff. And then at, at least half the session is open mic, right? So that's uh, what we'll, you know, express your concerns, express your input, whatever it is you have to, have to say. I mean, you can shout out a question or a comment anytime while any of us are talking, but I just want to make sure you hear what we have to say first. I think that's important. Um, to make sure you got all the information, then you can tell it, then you can call, you know, bullshit or whatever you want to do. Um, so let's start with the introductions. I'm going to pass the mic over first to Ron. Oh, you got your own mic. I have okay. a mic. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy that we're able to do this. I, this is my uh, second DEF CON. And uh, the purpose, as, as uh, Paul indicated, is that we have this organization of enterprise folks and we have the Ethereum community, and we really want to know what we can do bilaterally. There is definitely actions that we can take in the EA and have them uh, through our members, as we're a member-driven organization. What can we do to help facilitate the growth and the success of the Ethereum mainnet? And that's primary purpose, as you know, the EA started out more in private permissioned uh, specifications, but you'll see an announcement this week. We're forming a working group initiative to collaborate with the Ethereum Foundation, cat herders, Ethereum magicians. So we really need a better direct line of communication and that's why um, actually how this all started is we asked the Ethereum Foundation what can we do here. And this is what they recommended. So here we are. So hopefully this can give us more of a direct line. And the main purpose is, if you think about it, is that any one entity and organization, whether you're decentralized or not, it's really hard to be successful if you do it on your own. And, and so if you take a look what's going on now with Hyperledger and, and Besu and everyone's still trying to figure it out. So this hopefully will be the initial start of uh, direct line communications. And, uh, and we're an open book. So uh, there's some folks think we're closed. We're not. We're an open book. Anybody can join us, and, but we definitely can get inputs. And so this is why we're here. So thank you. 
Hey, Hudson, you're up. Hey, what's up, everyone? Um, I'm Hudson. I am uh, with the Ethereum Foundation, representing them today. Um, I think it's really exciting that the EEA is getting more involved in mainnet. Uh, there's definitely some uh, business applications, things of that nature. Uh, you know, whenever like you think about the early internet, there were you know just kind of nerds on it mostly, right? I'm actually not old enough to be with the early internet. I was in diapers, but from what I've heard. Uh, the early internet didn't have things like Amazon. It didn't have the Facebook. It didn't have like these really massive, uh, you know, infrastructure to handle all that stuff. And we're in the early days. Go copy, sir. <laughs> Go copy, sir. Prodigy. Uh, so basically, uh, we're still in that really early day. We're still in that really early days. And uh, because of that, we'll need all the support we can get from every single corner of the use cases, of the businesses, of the volunteers, of the crypto anarchist, everybody, to uh, get together and uh, work on this stuff uh, so that we can all benefit from it in the end. I also think it's exciting that we have um, our executive director, Aya Miyaguchi, um, helping with the EEA now. That's a really cool development. Uh, I believe she's on the board, right? Yeah, she's on the board now of the EEA. And uh, with that, I think that's also showing that the EF is willing to uh, partner with the likes of UNICEF, um, Parity with the grants program, the EEA. We're really reaching out to everybody because through this um, you know, level of subtraction that we're kind of pitching here. We want to help everyone else, and we're not in this to grow and be like a drive, like the driving force in the ecosystem. We want to help others be a driving force in the ecosystem. That's you guys. That's all of y'all. So, and on the stream, unless you don't like us, and then we don't want you. But if you like us <laughs> and you want to support us, then that's great. You know what? Even if you don't like us, we're going to make you like us. <laughs> And that's my intro. Thanks, Hudson. Beautiful. All right, Jamie. Why'd you, why'd you skip lane? Oh, there's an order. Yeah. Okay. Mike, Sorry, I'm an orderly guy. Mike isn't stretching. It's a little bit of a <laughs> madness over here. Okay. You, you guys messed up my order. My name is Jamie Pitts, and um, I do work at the Ethereum Foundation um, as DevOps, but I also I volunteer with the magicians, and so I, I guess today you could say I'm representing um, the operations group and the magicians. Um, and um, to give you an introduction to myself, I'm, I was involved in the early web, so I come from the orientation where like things are really messed up, and it's okay if it's like looks really janky. And the early web was extraordinarily janky, and so I look at early Ethereum, and and it is extraordinarily janky. But actually, I think there's there's so much more there than the early web in a way, um, and so the potential is amazing. Um, and so yeah, I think I've uh, Ethereum has radicalized me. I'll put it that way. Um, I believe in it to a great extent. I believe in the philosophies that go into it, and all of us have different philosophies, but I think there's common, there's common philosophies. And I'd have to say the technology has affected the way I look at, the way I look at politics, the way I look at how people organize. And so, yeah, it's really interesting how just getting involved with the technology can change, change you. Um, and um, in terms of um, involving corporations, I'm very skeptical. Um, I think corporations are out to exploit and um, I think if there's a way that we can show them a different, uh, a different path, otherwise we're going to destroy them. We have to, because they're going to they're eat us alive. So I, I think we can show them a different way. And Ethereum is an opportunity to create a new kind of corporation. And it's up to us to make that happen. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah. So I don't know if that's right. Thank you, Jamie. All right, Lane. No, Am I? you're up. Oh, I'm next. You're okay. up. I'll, I'll, I'll stay sitting down. Hey guys, uh, I'm Lane. I'm here representing the Ethereum cat herders today. Let me get one thing out of the way up front. Like as, as Jamie alluded to a moment ago, like all of us have multiple affiliations. And in fact, when I walked into the room a moment ago, Hudson came over to me and said, who am I representing again today? Because I think you have, you've checked three or four of the boxes probably on, on the folks up here. So I think that actually speaks very powerfully as well to like the degree of collaboration that we have in this community um, that, that we all kind of overlap in our, in our daily roles. Um, it's pretty 
amazing to be sitting up here representing the cat herders because this uh, initiative was actually born in a room just like this exactly a year ago in Prague uh, in, a, in a sort of accidental fashion where uh, myself and a couple of others just made an open call for folks who wanted to contribute to Ethereum in general and kind of to um, uh, coordinating the upcoming mainnet hard fork uh, upgrades, network upgrades uh, specifically. Um, for anyone who wanted to get involved and contribute to things like project management. Um, and it's sort of grown beyond our like wildest dreams uh, since then. And, and it's a big, you know, big international group of, of folks who um, have, I think, added a lot of value and will continue to do so. Uh, so again, it's really, it sends shivers down my spine to be sitting up here representing that group now a year later. Uh, and, and actually in very similar fashion, I think, to the way uh, the magicians were born a year prior to that as well. So again, just speaks very powerfully to the power of what the Ethereum community can do in an organic way when we put our minds together. Um, can I have a show of hands? How many people is the first DevCon? Okay, that's a lot of people. So holy crap. Well, welcome to DevCon. Welcome to the community. Um, this is a very, very, very special event. This is my third DevCon. I'm sure you guys have probably like fourth or fifth or something by now. Yes. Yeah, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, welcome. Hey, got you guys, John, Annette. Let's give a few words. Sorry, I didn't put slides up for you, but go ahead. I have a slide at the end of the presentation. <laughs> uh, hey, everyone. I'm Annette, and I'm helping out basically with the operations of Ethereum Magicians. Um, and I'm getting involved a lot in a community work around Ethereum. And I'm trying to be like the cute side of Ethereum and like memeing out everything what is possible. And that's basically it, I would say. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. John? Hi, I'm John Wolpert. Uh, I guess I could say I'm on team internet. I'm on team consensus. I'm on team Ethereum. I'm uh, one of the founders of team Hyperledger for my sins. Um, and, uh, and in general, I'm on team working together. Um, and in fact, for, as proof of that, I would like to demonstrate this is Vitalik Buterin's t-shirt from consensus 2016 or 2015, where we were announcing Hyperledger, and I said, yeah, I would love to announce Hyperledger with an Ethereum shirt on to make a statement that it's about all of us, not just groups of bands of mostly humans. And he pulled the t-shirt straight off his body and gave it to me, and I went on stage with this, and I've had it in a treasured spot in my house ever since. And he's never washed it. <laughs> I have definitely washed it. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think this is a, a tremendous year. This is the year of convergence, or this is about to be, maybe 2020. Well, I, was, I had a hand in the year of divergence in 2015, and um, we've, had, we've been all on different explorations. We needed to do that, and now it's time that we, we have the bandwidth. We have worked out some key problems that we needed to work out on all sides, and now it's time to, yeah, to show, I mean, the corporations and everybody else, all groups of mostly humans, need to learn how to work together better, and we're gonna show how to do that. Thanks, John. Tim, you wanna say anything or no? Yeah, he doesn't wanna talk. All right. So let me take about 10 minutes and, and uh, tell you what the EEA is all about. You know, you guys, if you wanna turn your chairs around for this, because I, I feel really weird talking at your backs. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, now you can heckle me. Uh, so what's the EEA about? Yeah. Heck, if I knew uh, when I was given the offer to join, um, I had no idea. Uh, I knew what Ethereum was, obviously, and I, I was looking to get into this space, but you know, when Ron offered me this position with the EEA, I wasn't sure this was the one I wanted to take. Um, so I did what I usually do. I, I hit Google, and I start looking around for research, and exactly what do industry organizations do? You know, what's their value, and is this the way I wanted to spend you know, the next uh, couple years of my career. And as I was doing that, I came across a really interesting, uh, you can't call it research, you can't even call it a study. I think it was just like some, some poll that was run by a travel company about two years ago, uh, where they just, you know, asked a random set of, uh, you know, US uh, smartphone holders, what would you give up for a month rather than lose your Wi-Fi access? All right, so first one, wine. I don't know how, why people are so willing to give up wine. I mean, it's my drink. Uh, fast food, coffee, self-explanatory, friends, your partner, a shower, 
<laughs> Listen, this is some pretty serious stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, we're talking about some technology here, and, and people are willing to give up the best parts of life for it. You know, for a while I was doing these full body cleanses twice a year, and, and for two weeks I would give up, you know, the wine, the junk food, and the coffee, and it, and it was a miserable experience. I felt good afterwards, but man, to give that stuff up for a month, I, I don't know how I could do it. Right, so what did this mean? How, you know, how did this all change? Because I am old enough and I know that this wasn't always the case, right? I built a house in 2000 and I wanted my house to be modern, state-of-the-art and future-proofed. I wanted to have data, voice and video all through the house, every room in the house, wherever I decided I wanted to be. So you know, I snuck into the house while it was being built with a buddy of mine and we ran um, two Cat5, two RG6 cables to 20 locations in the house. It was a miserable cold day in the middle of January, but we got the work done. You know, this is my wife after she saw what I had done to the house, um, but there was a reason for it, right? In 2000, Wi-Fi was not reliable. You know, I was doing a fair amount of travel in those days, and you know, whatever Wi-Fi was there was really only intended for laptops, and, and, it, and it was awful. You know, you'd go somewhere and you'd have to really open up your settings, fiddle with it, make it work. Um, there was no interoperability. It was really quite a mess. And the reason is that, you know, there was a great standard in place, right? The IEEE, the first 802 standard, was a great standard, and people were building products to that standard. But the IEEE is not assigned any resources to do any testing or certification or to make sure anything works with each other. Right, so you had basically a lot of vendors coming out with products and saying, you know, we're IEEE 802 compliant. Uh, and of course the stuff wouldn't work, right? So how did we get from this, you know, where, where I'm wiring my house with a whole bunch of cables to where people are willing to give up the best parts of life for Wi-Fi? And it turns out it was the formation of an industry organization. Um, it was called the wire, the wonderful term, Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance. There's one that rolls off the tongue, WECA. <laughs> um, one of the first things they did was they changed it to the Wi-Fi Alliance, probably the smartest move they made. Um, but what was it that they did uh, to make the change um, in this scenario? Well, the first thing they did is they understood that, you know, a standard is good, but you need to have some market-driven specifications around that. So you need to understand what's the market looking for, what functions, functions and features do they want in order to start buying product. So they started building market-driven specifications around the IEEE standard and other standards. And we'll explain what that means in a few minutes. Uh, but then they combined this, most importantly, with certification testing. Right, so if you were a member of the Wi-Fi Alliance, you could, go, you could put a product through a certification suite, and then the, 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 the buyers of that product would be assured that it was interoperable, that it, was, it would be able to work nice and play nice with any other stuff out on the market. It's this combination of market-driven specifications and a certification testing program that makes people want to spend their money. All right, that's what gets you to web scale adoption. That's what gets you from, you know, a geeky technical standard, you know, just a few people know it and understand it, to something that's really gonna drive markets. And that's what they did. Um, Wi-Fi just works, and the way that I term it is, technology stewardship and market stewardship have to work one and one. Right, so, you know, the EF and a lot of you guys are really great at focusing the technology, making the technology move forward. What we're trying to do at the EEA is get that market perception in here and start to build out what's needed to make this thing web scalable. Now, what would you give up for a month rather than lose the ethernet? All right, I'm not really asking you guys because I know if I ask you, I'm gonna get all the same answers I got up front, maybe some even more startling ones. But if you were to like go out of this room, go out of this hall, you know, and start asking people around town here, or even your friends and family, you know, they're gonna give you a blank stale and say, Ethernet? <laughs> no, I said that on purpose. They're gonna hear Ethereum, they're gonna go, Ethernet? They don't, they don't know, all right? You know, I've got, I, the people ask me, so you, you took a new job, what are you doing? I work, I work in Ethereum. Huh? Oh, Ethereum? It's a blockchain thing. Blockchain? 
Did you ever hear of Bitcoin? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, but well, it's something kind of like that. Um, and that's where we are today. Uh, we, 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 you know, people aren't going to give up anything. So how do you get from where we are today, where the average consumer is going to start to recognize Ethereum? Well, that's why the EA was formed. Um, we were formed by the major industry players at the time, um, but now we're a very, very diverse group that's not just big people, it's little people. In fact, I'd say most of our membership is, is under uh, like a handful of, handful of folks. So we have a really great uh, selection of folks. We've got people from the private sector, so the big and the small companies. We've got tech producers, we've got industry verticals. We've got consumers as well. So a lot of, a lot of the banks are there, consumers, a lot of the places that are gonna use this stuff. Yeah, I know there's not a lot of love for government here, but you know, you still, they still exist. You still gotta coexist with them and they're uh, informing us here. We've got academics, we've got civil society. We work kind of the way that these groups work. Everybody in this organization has an equal voice. So, you know, John's from Consensus, one of the bigger companies in the group. If you're a small 10-person uh, shop, you've got the same voice as Consensus in the EEA. And that's something pretty significant. And, and it really does work that way. And our goal is to develop a neutral, competitive, and credible market view, period. There's three things we do to make this happen, and uh, very much it follows the same lines as the Wi-Fi Alliance and other industry alliances. Uh, I didn't mean to you know, int intimate that the Wi-Fi Alliance is the only one doing this. Ron here, my boss, has worked for what, four or five others, at least. Um, there's a lot of them out there, and a lot of the technologies that you know and love and accept um, have all been pushed that way through some sort of, a, of an industry organization, and we're pretty much the same. So uh, we do this by publishing open standards-based architecture and technical specifications. We do not write code, all right? So we're not a code shop, we're a specification shop. Um, the next step of the process is to build trust in, that, in those products built to those specifications by producing a certification process. Our test net is going to be up and running, yeah, a couple of weeks, like almost any day now. And the certification tests and the certification process should be ready sometime next year. So we're ready to start moving to that next step. Um, and then we, we, we do marketing. All right, we're not going to talk about marketing here today, but you know, we make sure that what's going on you know, with you guys that are members, uh, what's going on in the community is, is well understood by those folks that we're trying to reach. So if we were to look at our architectural stack, and, and Charles, I did update it, so we got the, the current one. Um, you should take some comfort in that. You know, what we do is we adopt and extend, right? So a lot of what's already out there is the formation and the basis of what we're building in the EEA. So at the core, you know, we have the core technologies that were defined, you know, in the Ethereum yellow paper and everything that's come since. And of course, as we move, move forward to ETH 2.0, you know, this is going to, you know, build out and we're going to start to pull all those other technologies in as well. So this stuff forms the core. What we do then is we, we kind of fill the gaps. What are enterprises looking for? What is the market asking for in order to run products on Ethereum? A lot of it has to do with the three Ps, right? Privacy, performance, and permissioning and the stuff that sits around that. So that's where a lot of the focus has been to date. Um, where it's going to go from here is really depends on the members. Uh, I'm not, you know, Ron and I don't dictate what goes on. The members drive the agenda for this organization. And then, of course, sitting at the top, you've got the application layer. Um, I haven't seen that we've done a lot there yet, uh, but what we do at the moment in our specs is we pick and choose, you know, what, what do you have to do, what should you do, what's good for you to do, and that sort of thing. All right, so we build out an architectural stack and then we produce specifications based off that stack. Currently, we have two. There is one for the uh, enterprise client, and there's one for off-chain trusted compute. Um, we released the latest versions of these specs today, uh, so they're currently at 4.0 there and 1.1 there. So this is, this is what we do. We build specifications, and then companies build products based on those specifications. So for example, Pantheon is uh, an enterprise client that uh, conforms, well, right word here, um, is built off of this spec. I can't say it's certified because we don't have a certification suite yet, but eventually when we do build one, then the, the current Pantheon product, I'm sure will submit to, um, to this spec. 
All right, and there's going to be some really good off-chain compute uh, demos coming up later this week. In fact, um, I really want to point attention to this session that's happening on Wednesday. Uh, what, what went on is something that really impressed me. Five of our member organizations banded together uh, and produced a, um, what's called a, it's a trusted token specification. Uh, the demo is something like a rewards token environment. And they use the client spec, they use the off-chain off trusted compute spec, and they also use something that the EEA is also responsible for called the token taxonomy initiative. Uh, I'm not really talking much about that today because that is uh, blockchain neutral, um, but of course it does uh, support Ethereum tokens as well. So we write specs, we don't write code, but what we're starting to see is a fair up, uptake of our specifications in Hyperledger. So Hyperledger, as you know, uh, received the Pantheon code as open source as Project Besu, right? And now Pegasus, I, I believe just last week it was announced that there's a Pantheon product that's coming out based on that. And even just last week, uh, the Avalon project was announced by Hyperledger, which is open source code that is based off of our trusted compute spec. All right, so you're gonna at some point be able to find that there are products that are gonna be uh, built on open source code that are gonna certify to the EA specifications. And this, is, this, we think, is really gonna help drive the marketplace and produce that web scale adoption that we're all looking for. All right, so this, so this is basically what we're all about. So just two points of history before I, I put the mic down, just so you know uh, where we were and, and where we are now and why we're having this meeting today. Um, and this is, you know, even before I joined, when the EEA was started, you know, there was this, uh, you know, this vision, this perception that the mainnet was not a safe place to be. It was run by a lot of partiers, you know, you're talking about, you know, all the stuff that you would hear in the press has to do with people, you know, doing naughty things and nasty things on the mainnet. And no enterprise is really going to want to be there because they're focused on privacy and permissioning and performance, and this wasn't really working for them. So the members initially focused primarily on um, private blockchains, private uh, implementations of, uh, based off of Ethereum technology. And that was a good start, and that's where the spec started from. But now we think of the mainnet as the magic bus, right? This is a good place, or it's becoming a good place to run business applications. And this is why the EA is starting to branch out and focus on specifications that can run on the mainnet. Um, of course, we're still going to focus on private permission chains. Those will never go away. We still have intranets, even though the internet has proven itself. But we can have both, and they can both have the same sorts of specifications, and they can talk to each other nice. So uh, to start to move this process forward, we formed the mainnet working group in the EEA. The interim chair is going to be Virgil Griffith, and I think a lot of you know. The interim vice chair is John sitting over there. Um, and, uh, you know, they don't know what they're going to do yet. Uh, they just started getting together. Some of the things that have been thought about are, you know, to start seeing what can we do to uh, bring Ethereum up and, and use the EIP process for that, right? That's one option. Um, another option uh, is to uh, focus on looking at the Ethereum documentation and, and kind of raising it to an enterprise grade specification. You know, be the voice of the EEA in public uh, Ethereum discussions like here. Um, but really, we kind of want you guys to have a say as to how this group operates. And, and I'm about to shut up and we can start to have that discussion. But one thing I want to point your attention to is there is a working group planning meetup happening on Thursday, uh, damn, that's right around lunchtime. Um, but well, buy your lunch, take it to the DevCon Park Amphitheater, and come and talk to Virgil and John uh, and decide how you want this thing to go. All right? So that was uh, a really a, a brief introduction to the EEA. Um, I'm really not from the government. I was told that might be funny, ha ha. <laughs> Um, but what I do have is I have a love for programming. I mean, like many of you, I started programming at a young age. Well, you know, for me, a young age is, was my late teens because there wasn't anything when I was growing up. Um, but yeah, that is me uh, in front of my Radio Shack TRS-80. Uh, notice, notice the cassette tape recorder, which, <laughs> which is where I stored all my programs. 
Um, I only bring this up because I want you to know that I, I do understand you. I am a developer at heart, even though I don't write code anymore, um, and I definitely don't have that box anymore. I spent a good part of my career you know, writing enterprise projects uh, for IBM. Uh, I did that for quite some time, so, so I know where you're coming from. I want to be your conduit of information back and forth through the EEA. All right, so I've set up a couple of things. You know, you can email me if any of you still use email. You can direct message me, you can telegram me. I've set up a, an open community on Slack and one on Gitter as well. I don't know where else you guys like to hang out. If there's some other place, let me know. Uh, I see a lot of folks taking pictures. I actually have put all of these slides on a, a shared Google Drive and, and we'll get the, we'll, we'll start to you know, talk about where they are as well so you don't have to, you know, and I guess it's gonna be on video too. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. So um, I hope that was helpful. What I want to do now is let each uh, of the communities come back up and just say a, you know, a few parting words, show a few slides, and then we're going to go open mic. So Hudson, you're going to be up first. All right. It's a great presentation. Um, there was a lot of points I really liked about that. There were some that confused me, and I think it's going to confuse the rest of you as we're just starting this process. So uh, I'm going to go through some of the interesting stuff first, some of the stuff that might kind of confuse you. At one point, um, they said the EEA writes specs, but they don't write code, right? It was something like that. Well, I think when you said that on the call with me a few weeks ago, there was kind of like, I think I said, because uh, I do the core developer meetings every two weeks, so I get involved with um, doing Ethereum 1.0 mainnet updates. The organizer for Ethereum 2.0 is Danny Ryan. So basically, I said, that's, that might not work very well because a lot of people who write EIPs, they're expected to build test cases. They're expected to uh, come together and help with the code uh, on their client or on someone else's client. Those are the ways EIPs get in quickest. But that doesn't mean it can't change. That means that that's how it is right now. And as we grow, there is going to be a need for some of this testing and certification and things like that. Uh, it's going to take some time. There's definitely distrust with the EEA right now. Um, some of their earlier efforts were focused on, and still, I guess, today are focused on private blockchains. And a lot of people said those are useless. A lot of core devs said those are useless. You probably said those I are useless. I built one, I say it's useless. Yeah, you built one and you say it's useless, uh, John. So, um, it's useless. It's not useless. basically, what I said at first, and this might be the case today from some just brief talking, is they're going to fucking hate you. That's exactly what I said. The core developers are going to fucking hate you because you're like, we want to build these specs, uh, and then you all are going to build it because you said companies build this stuff because that's how it's been traditionally. Well, in Ethereum world, companies don't build this except for maybe Besu, which they're doing a great job, by the way. It's volunteers. It's people who are completely anonymous that aren't going to sign NDAs, that aren't going to sign uh, these like copyright agreements. It's people who come in. Uh, who are working, who are donated by people like the Ethereum Foundation, Consensus, uh, Protocol Labs, all kinds of people like that. It's such a mix and it's such so many different differing views that coming together for something like this is going to be a real challenge. And I think the EEA understands that, uh, which is really promising to me because a lot of people don't get it. And I, I feel like you guys actually get it. Uh, so. That's, that's kind of a short of the point of view to go into more detail. Um, how this EIP process works, if you were in the last session, you got like a deep dive into it, I'm sure. But um, EIPs are a protocol, it's, you know, there's different kinds of EIPs, but the ones we're kind of referring to today are core EIPs. So you go in and you say, I want to do something with ZK snarks on Ethereum. And right now it's really expensive uh, because there's like this thing called opcodes that need to be changed or added or adjusted. And so you go in and you write an EIP and you say, for the purpose of doing ZK snarks on Ethereum, I want this to happen. Here's a sample code snippet and here's some testing cases. Uh, and then they go to the core devs and they say, all right, this is something the community wants. There's maybe multiple stakeholders. We think it's important, so we're going to build it. Or if you want to build it, that'll get it in quicker, generally. Uh, so we've worked with the Zcash Foundation and with the Zcash community before to get ZK snarks on Ethereum 
years ago, uh, early on. And we worked with them recently to get another op code in, uh, or a few op codes that uh, do a similar, uh, I say op code, I meant pre-compile, sorry. Someone's gonna get really mad at me for like messing up these terms. Uh, Pre-compiles in the system so that we can um, do like more efficient ZK snarks. So they uh, had some developers develop a spec, they had some developers write code, and it got in in uh, one of the hard forks. Uh, they, uh, there's an upcoming hard fork, Constantinople, I hope, I get that confused because we've named so many, but Constantinople's coming up, and oh, Istanbul. Istanbul, crap, yes, thank Woo! you. Constantinople's happened, Istanbul, oh my gosh, I need to be better at this. <laughs> there's a song. Yes, yes, Istanbul was once Constantinople. Uh, so basically, um, when that's coming up, we're gonna include more updates. Uh, right now, there's a few processes from a core developer perspective that are broken. The EIP system needs to be updated. It's very confusing if you've ever written an EIP. I think that's something that the EEA can jump into and has experience in writing these kind of, uh, you know, perspectives and these kind of repositories of people's uh, specifications. Uh, there's also just the core dev process that, and the hard fork process that we're fixing right now. Normally, we have, and actually, if you wanna attend my talk on the main stage tomorrow at 10, I'm gonna be talking more about this, but um, I'm actually right after Vitalik, so that's not nerve wracking at all. Uh, anyways, uh, going forward, we're gonna change from a hard fork timing model where we go in and we set up a time and we say, we're doing a hard fork on this date. And then we go in and we try to fit as many in as we can and we're rushed and we're figuring out how to fit these EIPs and we're not coding in time and the test cases aren't built to an EIP centric model where we do hard forks as EIPs are done and if they have to happen to be bundled together, that's great. If they aren't bundled together, then they go to the next hard fork. So they're gonna happen more frequently. Uh, the Ethereum cat herders are going to be doing better about reaching out to miners, exchanges and major corporations and uh, infrastructure projects like Infura to make sure they're ready to upgrade uh, because it's no one's no it's no one's job to tell these companies and exchanges what to do but that's where the cat herders come in so I think it's really important that we have groups like that yep we got we got a few cat herders in the audience actually like yeah and um, I'm a co-founder of the cat herders along with Lane and uh, Offery and I'm missing someone Piper Merriam Piper, you here? No, it's okay, he's in our hearts. Uh, so basically, um, to wrap this up, I see a lot of um, good things that could happen with this collaboration between the EEA, but there are some wounds that are gonna have to heal, not that anyone ever got into a fight, but like, people are skeptical. Like, why would we help things we're trying to destroy? Jamie kind of alluded to that. What are we gonna do, what are we gonna do in certain situations where uh, EEA and the businesses that are related to it are gonna panic when we get big enough that there's a child abuse now. Are we gonna whitelist things? Is there gonna be clients that whitelist? I don't know. Uh, there, there's like things that we're not anticipating that are gonna happen that are gonna be really big deals. This is supposed to be censorship resistant. This is supposed to be decentralized. Uh, are we really gonna stick to our ethos? I don't know. So stuff like that are, just remains to be seen. Um, but I have a lot of hope that we're going to have great collaborations in the future. There's going to be a lot of uh, resources probably donated and helping out. I know the Besu team, uh, I hope I'm saying that right, has been uh, excellent uh, partners with these other clients um, building on the main net. Their, their uh, client is excellent. Whenever we have test cases out, yeah. Yeah, clap for them. They Seriously, uh, Dano has been on like every core dev call, every other call. He's picking his kids up from school and he's like, all right, I'm picking my kids up, but like if I don't talk, it's because they're getting in the car. And I'm just like, damn, that's dedication. So um, yeah, they're, they're a great partner and I have a lot of hope for the future on all this stuff. So stay tuned. I think there's gonna be a lot more information as we get our uh, channels up with the cat herders as we get more stuff out, maybe we'll do a newsletter. People love those, right? I, I don't know anymore. So we'll do, we'll do something to get the word out for sure. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. And here's the world famous Jamie Pitts. 
All right, apparently there's some slides here. Um, yeah, I mean, we earlier we introduced the magicians. I think a lot of people in the audience were here for that, so I'm not going to get too deep into it. Um, but we're basically uh, an open community of people who want to organize around technology changes. Um, and so, yes, we focus on EIPs and ERCs. Um, a lot of times we want to facilitate uh, creativity and people to come together for new initiatives, and, and so we're, we're really down for that. Um, and a, a key thing that we do, key infrastructure is communications infrastructure. So we have this, this forum at ethereum-magicians.org. And um, you can see if you go there, you immediately get dumped into all these conversations, really specific conversations about EIPs. But sometimes people will try to gather together some people of uh, uh, birds of a feather kind of thing and say, hey, we got a new initiative. And so you'll see a lot of those snowball on the forum. Um, and the key is open process. We don't, we're not exclusive. And um, I think everyone could call themselves a magician who, who is uh, interested in learning Ethereum, any kind of aspect of Ethereum, because there's so many aspects to get into. Um, uh, and individual representation is a key value for us. Um, we don't want people representing their organizations, even though in this panel we're, repre we're, we're attempting to represent our organizations and institutions. Um, when we have conversations, we want you to represent your expertise, not the interest of, of your group. Of course, your boss is going to be telling you to, to, to represent them, and that's fine. Um, and the key is rough consensus and running code. And Hudson alluded to this, is that it, when, when there's an EIP, we want to see tests and we want to see prototypes, that kind of thing. Like you'll take GEF and you'll implement what you're proposing, and then that's accepted, and you can talk about that. Um, and the, the rough consensus part is, let's say there's several people coming to consensus. That's the conversation. And you reach consensus as opposed to some kind of vote. The people on, in the group come together and, and work out how to find, achieve consensus on that. And that's a process that's very hard to define. You know, we hear about voting, and we think that's a very solid way to go. But consensus enables you to really uh, in a subtle way, find, find a common ground and listen to each other. And sometimes you have to make compromises, and that's OK. Um, and so those two, rough consensus and running code, one's very, like, it's kind of a hard and soft aspect of it. Um, and so I guess the opportunities here, like um, some of the opportunities with the EEA, um, I think the key is, with the EEA community, it sounds like, I mean, from my impression, it's, is it hundreds of corporations who are members of this and government institutions? Hundreds. And every one of these, I mean, many of these organizations are vast, like very vast, huge organizations. Um, and so basically, that organization has somebody who is designated to participate in the EEA. That means we have people in corporations who are interested in Ethereum, who are learning about Ethereum, who are working with the EEA, that is an opportunity for us to influence what's happening at those corporations. Um, and we can influence them about the EIP process, community-driven software development, um, and what Mainnet is trying to do, how it's permissionless, all these different values, decentralization, all these different values and things that we're working on. We can, we can start to bring that and educate them and the corporations about it, and then start to change those corporations hopefully not getting that person fired. Um, but if they're fired, they'll come and work with us. It's fine. Um, educate. And, and we need to learn about these corporations and what their process is. The key to the corporations is their efficiency. They, they have mandates. And their mandates are often, I think, very simple. Um, they, they need to return, have returns for the shareholders. They're very focused on that. And you hear some changes, like they're, oh yeah, let's, let's worry about the environment a little bit. But primarily, it's about sharehold, boosting shareholder value. Um, we can learn about what, what's going on with that, how that works, how corporations work, how, how they're efficient. We can learn from that efficiency. I think in our community, we're, we're inefficient. That's, the cat herders are named cat herders for a reason, right? Um, and it's, it's an extraordinary process to try to herd those cats. Um, we can learn to be more efficient. And I think the cat herders emerging, actually it's an ironic thing because the cat herders is the introduction of much more efficiency in a process that was previously inefficient. So in a way, we're going corporate, right? We don't have to adopt their culture, but we can steal the way they do things, their ideas, their efficiencies. And so I, I really commend the cat herders for doing that. 
Um, magicians can learn to do that too. I think we're actually much more disorganized than the cat herders. Um, okay, we're going to Lane now. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thanks everyone for your awesome presentations. Before I dive into talking about the cat herders, I just wanna uh, share a couple quick thoughts on um, how we can all collaborate better. I think if there's kind of one theme I'm taking away from this conversation, it's about breaking down walls. I think that our community is a community that we don't believe in building walls. We believe that we, uh, what, what unites us is much greater than the things that separate us and we can learn a lot from each other. Um, and I'm really happy as well, Hudson, that you touched upon things like trust um, I just want to share that like, I was very intimately involved in the um, core dev calls and the EIP process for about 18 months. Um, and throughout this time, I heard EEA mentioned many times, um, but had very few touch points, had very few chances to kind of uh, meet folks like Paul and Ron um, and understand what you guys are doing and where it comes from and definitely had, uh, and, and still do, to be honest, like a, a healthy degree of skepticism about um, you know, I mean, as Hudson mentioned, we have this concept of like, oh, permission blockchain, like that's not really a blockchain. Why would we as core developers, you know, care about that or want to support it or contribute to it? Um, we see companies like Microsoft um, launching products based on Ethereum open source permissively licensed software. And initially we have um, naive thoughts, like why aren't they contributing more to core development, right? Why aren't they sort of paying for core developers to kind of um, you know, contribute directly to the project? So the only point I'm trying to make is that it's very essential that we come together in forums such as these to have these conversations. Uh, and I see a great deal of potential as, as wonderful and wonderfully chaotic as like the Ethereum mainnet uh, core development process is. Um, Initiatives like the Cat Herders have arisen for a reason, as Jamie mentioned a moment ago. Uh, we can learn a great deal from uh, folks such as, as you guys, you gentlemen, who um, have a lot of industry expertise, have had quote unquote real jobs at quote unquote real companies like IBM before. Uh, I'm a lot less anti-corporate than, than maybe Jamie or some people in this room having worked in the financial industry myself in the past and yet I do have that skepticism. So um, yeah, so so again, what unites us is, is much greater than the stuff that divides us and I think that we all uh, share common goals in, in our vision for what Ethereum can be and can evolve into. And I think we all recognize as well that if we don't come together and work together as a community and collaborate across the aisle, so to speak, uh, we won't reach those goals. So I just want to express my gratitude for, for you guys for organizing this and bringing us together. This is a very exciting, important forum. Uh, I, I will say a couple more words about the cat herders, but did, did you have something you wanted to add? OK, cool. Oh, there are slides. You made slides, didn't you? No, someone made slides. Tim. Thank you, Tim. I haven't seen these slides yet, which is my fault. So we're going to explore these together. The Cat Herders came together in 2019 to help with project management in Ethereum. Um, so yeah, so, so very, very briefly, um, the Cat Herders, as I mentioned in the beginning of this panel, were born in a very ad hoc fashion um, just before DevCon last year at Prague. It was at a hackathon organized by the uh, Fantastic Status organization. And so, okay, so, so here's how I like to describe it. Um, I've been told that the definition of innovation is when like a need meets a solution. And so I like to think of the cat herders as, uh, as an innovation in the Ethereum community because um, there was sort of a, a supply side issue and a, and a demand side issue, right? So the supply side issue is that there are many incredible people in the Ethereum community who for whatever reason uh, don't feel super comfortable rolling up their sleeves and jumping into like, um, uh, like technical governance, right? So that could be the Ethereum magicians, it could be the all core devs process or something else. But really capable, fantastic people who have time and a lot of value to add. So that's sort of the supply side. And the demand side is, as we've heard a few times today already, uh, there's a lot of wonderful chaos and inefficiency in kind of the Ethereum um, core development, research and development process. And um, in particular, the number of stakeholders has grown enormously. If you rewind even three, four years, if you look at all the recordings of the core devs calls and things like that, you'll see, you know, there were kind of 10, 12, 15 people on these calls. Nearly everyone was either a part of the Ethereum Foundation or Consensus or Parity. That's no longer the case. If you look at the calls today, especially like the ETH2 calls, there's sometimes as many as 60 or 80 people participating in these calls, representing dozens of organizations around the world. And so as the number of stakeholders has grown and the diversity of projects represented um, and, and contributing to these initiatives has grown, 
uh, we've realized that there's just more need for coordination. Uh, and, and it's kind of like a Goldilocks thing. Like we don't want too much because that starts to feel a little corporate and then you know, people kind of get turned off, but, but we don't want too little because that leads to, to chaos and, and, and we struggle to, to uh, efficiently roll out you know, network upgrades and things. So that was kind of the supply and the demand that met in the creation of the cat herders. Uh, it was a very organic thing. There was a, a, initially a group of four people which quickly grew into kind of 10 or 12 people uh, who came together at DevCon last year in ad hoc conversations. Um, is this the only slide? No. There's more? <laughs> right, so what is the cat herder? What, what do the cat herders do as a community? So we're now somewhere in the order of about 20 people. Um, so note taking was the very first thing the cat herders did for, so like I personally took notes for the core devs calls for quite some time and just realized it's not sustainable for many reasons, right? I, I may not be able to make a call. Um, or, or just didn't have time sometimes. So um, this, this, this community of folks came together. We, we raised some funding, super proud of the fact that it was 100% crowdsourced community funding for that first year. Although recently now, we, I believe the cat herders have just received um, some grant funding from both the Ethereum Foundation and from Aragon. Um, I think those are the sources. Moloch Dao as well. So thank you to all of those um, organizations. Um, so right, so we have, we have cat herders joining all the major community calls the core devs calls, the ETH2 calls, et cetera. Um, communications is another big piece of the mandate of the cat herders. So there is a medium blog um, communicating the progress on audits, like the ProgPow audit, as well as the upgrade timelines for, um, for Constantinople, Istanbul. Um, and fundraising activities as well. So the cat herders uh, and, and Hudson led this initiative. So thank you, Hudson, for all the hard work you did on this, raising funding for the ProgPow audit, um, Gitcoin grants, et cetera. And, and really, it's, um, it's an open platform, right? So as the slide suggests, um, you know, and as Jamie said a moment ago, there, there, there's no such thing as like officially being a member or not being a member of the Cat Herders. It's, a, it's an open community that everyone is welcome to join and contribute to. Uh, the things the Cat Herders work on are exactly those things that the community feels need to be done. Um, we have a uh, PM repository, a project management repository on GitHub where anyone is free to throw issues into it um, and sometimes these involve like even like the ethereum.org website has a DNS issue or something that ultimately will be handled by, by one of you guys. Uh, you know, it's sort of an Ethereum foundation thing, but the cat herders are meant to be like the customer service desk for Ethereum, right? So anything anyone in the community thinks needs to be done, like cat herders is a good place to start. Uh, cool. Collaboration ideas. This is my last slide. Um, <laughs> Promote relevant EEA activities in mainnet community. Put stakeholders from different parts of Ethereum in touch to move projects forward. So yeah, I think uh, that's it in a nutshell, right? What the cat herders is really, really good at is coordination, as the name suggests, and communication, uh, something that engineers are not always so great at. Um, and on the EEA side, bring non-blockchain enterprises into the Ethereum. Sorry, I'm reading the slides, and we'll, we'll kind of analyze this together. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Tim. I just wanted to say a note to this. It's not this like the reason why Elaine is so confused right now about those slides. It's not because um, we are completely disorganized, but it's because Elaine was um, just ignoring our emails and calls and stuff. When when you put up the slide with with the seven different communication channels and the first one was email and you said, if, "Does anyone still use this?" I shook my head. I'm kind of like I, I live in a post-email world, so I'm sorry. Oh, Elaine, I reach out to you on Telegram, <laughs> so please don't. <laughs> So I agree with everything on this slide. I think that there's an enormous amount that we can accomplish together. Uh, I would like to shut up and listen because I think we have open questions coming up. Um, but just going back to this one, there's a link. I just want to highlight this link. If you want to get involved, just quick pitch, please, 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 everyone in this room, there's an enormous amount to be done. There's an enormous amount that everyone here can, can add to the conversation and contribute to the cat herders. So start in this Gitter channel. It's open to the community. Um, and uh, join the calls and jump in and help um, do all the things that need to be done. Thank you. So just one quick shout out while you guys turn your chairs back around. Um, a lot of thanks to John, Annette, and Tim for helping me put this together. They helped me figure out you know, what the uh, agenda would be, what the messaging should be. Got all these brilliant panelists here for me to, you know, to ignore my emails and stuff like that. Um, but really, thanks, guys. Great job. So we have half an hour for open forum, open mic. Um, Make sure that you grab a mic when you talk. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to disconnect so I can take some notes. 
I've also got EEA members in the audience. Please answer anything. If I, all right, well, they're all going up, so I'm going to shut up and sit down. Uh, can I make a comment on? Hi, I'm Jeremy. I have some responsibility for the EEA being a thing. Um, actually, probably the most. Um, but um, I wanted to make a comment on the the concerns for, of corporates versus Ethereum, right? And so first, uh, when we really started the EEA, the reference document for how the EEA should work was the DAO of the IETF, um, going way back when. But the second one was like, there were two, there were three concerns. We were, the, so the EEA was sort of, also came into being at a DevCon thing in Shanghai in 2016. And, and there were two concerns um, I saw, three. One was whether private permission blockchains were a good thing or a bad thing, they were happening. And the dominant way they were happening was taking an a open source Ethereum code base and changing it. And the problem was those code bases were incompatible. So you couldn't reach consensus between two different private implementations of Ethereum, which if you believed in a future state where you had an internet of blockchain world was a bad thing, right? So guarding against the bad outcome of incompatible versions of Ethereum, right? Particularly if you believe that there are probably some things that are gonna sit on a, a, a blockchain network that you are gonna want to be private or permissioned or what have you, right? The second thing, the second element of it was um, R3 and Hyperledger were doing, were starting to enter the business of Ethereum bashing and there wasn't really a entity other, you know, there were some private companies but there wasn't really a trade organization that had a point of view and a permission and a voice to, to enter that conversation and have a stake at the table I, and we thought that was really important to have, right? And then the third thing is, um, I'm an ex-banker too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, do, I, I do believe, uh, so on that comment, I, 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 have, I have two beliefs. One is, if you really want to change the world, you sort of need to try and change all of it, right? And so if we end up decentralizing the core financial system 20%, the positive externalities, even if we don't achieve full decentralization, the positive externalities of even decentralizing the core financial system 20 or 30 percent are almost enumerate, right? Like the benefits of what you can do for open access to financial services, what you can do for greater equality, right? So even if we can't achieve the overall goal, there's a big benefit there, right? So if you want to change the world, you have to change all of it. And then the second part of that being is there are businesses and companies growing up around decentralized technology. And, and, and Ethereum, right? And so where is the right community? So for example, the speed of mainnet increases price volatility, right? I, I, the Cumberland team was here and they left. It's because what happens is liquidity tries to move between the exchanges, people try to move their assets, uh, you get price dislocations. By the time the assets get to the exchange, it has the price dislocation, the dislocations move, they all move back and you get greater vol. Right? That's bad for the Ethereum community overall. Right? So where is the, uh, the right community forum for those type of discussions to take place? I would argue it's inside of a trade organization, which is why you know, we at Consensus, working with Ron, have been really trying to push the EEA in addressing the business issues of running um, valuable transactions on the mainnet. So I just wanted to share those three points of, three points of view. Right? The, the need to have if we are going to have subnets that are private and permission, the need for them to be inter interoperable and, and compatible, right? The need to have a voice that to, uh, to, to be the voice of a more decentralized enterprise, the need to try and change all the world at the same time, and the need to have uh, a community where businesses that build their businesses running on Ethereum can explain what the business impact is of some of the technical decisions and architectures. Hey, guys. So thanks, of course, for organizing this. But uh, I'd like to make a few things on EEA, correct? So EEA was launched. Let's, yes, yeah, sure. So Sam Falah, I work on Quorum. I lead the Quorum engineering team. I've been engaged with the community since DevCon 1. closer to your mouth. Since DevCon 1, and I've been working on Quorum, let's say, for the last four years. Four years. Um, the engagement through EEA maybe started recently, but we've been working with the core engineering team at the F Foundation and the core Ethereum G for all of the clients in general over the last four years. So it's not something we started recently. EEA was meant just for a way for us to organize that effort and bring it together, whether it's with the community or with enterprises 
in general to get them to adopt Ethereum. Um, the way it started maybe, as Jeremy was explaining, that it was um, other companies trying to sell their own version of blockchain. And that's where we saw a limitation. We didn't want that. So what we did, we took a public main Ethereum client, which is the Go Ethereum client, and we, we, made, we built the tools available for it, or we made tools available for it to be able to run it in an enterprise environment. What does that mean? If you do continuous integration, we give you all the tools and all the scripts and all of the code yeah, that you need to be able to run it there. So Hudson, I think, worked at USSA for a bit. USSA runs Quorum, and the only way they were able to run it because we customized it with some tools for them to be able to deploy it into their own data centers. We made the solidity available for them so they can learn how the EVM works and how to actually build smart contracts and how to audit and formally review those smart contracts. You cannot do that in enterprise without having all of these tools available for you. Same thing for uh, zero knowledge proofs. You cannot run it in an actual private, sorry, in a public network, correct? The gas cost is too expensive. Maybe now with Istanbul, it's gonna decrease. But we were able to customize the gas price to be able to run the contracts in an environment where you can build a permission network. And ultimately, over time, we see a lot of these features feeding into mainnet. So now we understand that there's a demand for you to be able to do privacy, better scalability. We saw the actual blog gas limit uh, recently increasing. And the reason that's been done, we've been working on that for a long time, correct? In a permissioned environment, you have more control, so you can decide how many transactions go in a block. And based on that, those learnings feed into mainnet. Um, I think one question I have is kind of, I'd, I'd be interested to know is, um, how is governance, how is this community communicating? Like, do they have a core devs? Do they have sub-organizations, groups that, like how, Where's this happening? Like, where's the forum? Where's the, where's the phone calls? I just want to second those sentiments. Like, I think having more open, active lines of communication would go a long way towards uh, addressing some of the like skepticism that a lot of folks feel. And I'm not the blame is on both sides, right? I don't want to put the blame specifically like on the EA side or whatever. But there are there's a there's a lot that we can learn from each other. And yet, I don't think we've had very active lines of communication. Like, again, from my na naive core dev perspective, it's like, why isn't EEA joining the core dev calls? I'm sure you guys have your versions of this. Like, why aren't we joining your calls, right? So, and, and more to the point, like, whose job is it to coordinate that? I think one of the benefits, and uh, hopefully you guys all agree, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. And if you believe that, then we absolutely need to learn what you guys have spent on the Ethereum mainnet, the community, and also share what, we'll share what we know. Uh, is that better? We'll share what we know based on, again, our corporate background. I spent 12 years at Intel doing telecom. So I have some understanding about how you get interoperability so your phone works wherever you go. And, and so it's, it's really challenging to figure out how we work. So I was very happy that we have this session but this is just a launch pad for the session. So I think, I think some of the ways that you asked about governance, it's real easy for us if we can set some uh, follow-up uh, sessions to share with you, okay, what's the best practices? How is it normally done? And then you can figure out what you want to use. And that's partly what you brought up. I mean, there's best from all the worlds, and I think it's not a black and white world. So as much as we all like de decentralization, the other side of it exists. And I think what you're seeing is that a lot of cooperation for us to figure out how we impart the information bilaterally. So I'm Charles. Uh, I'm like the flunky behind the technical work who actually puts these things together. So some of the answers to your questions are the phone calls happen inside EEA member space. It's like, and that's above my pay grade, so, you know. Um, but what happens Wait, can in, you clarify what you just said there? Yeah, what does that mean? What, so what, what that you means say is... and help us understand that? If you are a member of EEA, then it looks the same as, for, to, to, to a member as you know, all core devs and the magicians looks to anyone who wants to be there, okay. right? And, and it actually works the same. It's like rough consensus and running code is what drives it. It's about the people who, and, and they're not like, you know, corporate monsters and corporate warriors driving stuff. It's use case driven. It's by, you know, people saying, look, this is 
it, it is enterprises doing it. It's like we have things that we want, like permission networks that we don't get off mainnet. Here are our use cases. Here is what we're trying to achieve. Here is how we do the technical, you know, or, or here are suggestions for the technical stuff. Let's get to consensus, which, as you say, is is really valuable and really hard, uh, do, but do you, worthwhile. You have a, do you have a forum and do you have phone calls that are like among your members? You have like yeah, hundreds every, of members. Every, every week I turn up to a phone and they call get together and, and, they, have these and you can calls. see. So the visibility you get is if you have a look at the, the specifications, look for the editor version of the spec, that that's, you know, comes off GitHub, it's updated every week. You can see exactly what's there in any given week. So you can watch it developing. What you can't see into is the discussion of issues, the issues that are raised. I think there was a mailing list that got abandoned that Bob built, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that, there was that for a little bit. Google Groups, okay. Right. I, mean, I, I think this is a, I think this is a... You probably should have a mic for the video. Yeah. Hey, there you go, Jim. No, no, this one is shorter. I mean, I, I, think, I think this is a point of, this is a point of debate at the board level of the EEA right now, right? Which is, if you want to have a member-driven organization for things like antitrust, confidentiality, and some of the things that big companies need, how do we get the level of openness required in the technical discussions? Right. And I think there is a... I think views on this are mixed. My personal view is the EEA is too closed, that we need to change our IP policy a little bit, and we need to open up the calls much more broadly. That's my personal opinion. That may or may not be the opinion of consensus, but that's my personal opinion. Um, but, but you're describing constraint, that there's a legal, there's a legal yeah. requirement to yeah. protect the IP. Well, so, so here's, the, here's the thing. What we actually do is we protect the ecosystem in, in the EEA, we protect the ecosystem against patent trolls, right? Which, which outside the world of Ethereum doesn't do. The rest of Ethereum is like, ah, nobody should come along and be a patent troll. Whereas EEA has actual legal procedures in place to screw them over and say, no, you can't do that, it won't work. We will block that behavior. And, and so that's some of the motivation behind why we actually have the setup we have. And one, one quick add-on, the reason why we do it is so that there's no royalty for everyone. And, and that's, so it's not because we want to encourage it. We try to do things so the corporate side, who may want to try to get a royalty payment out of this, we try to protect it. Yeah. So members, are, they're not allowed to make um, I just wanted to add uh, something that all members, everybody who works for EF, has access to EEA Absolutely. access. To, yeah. So, hi everyone. My name is Jody Rich. I joined the EEA today. Thank you very much, Ron. Um, and I'd like to introduce Cameron Bell. Where are you, Cameron? Uh, Cameron and I co-founded NFT.NYC. Um, which is an event all about NFTs every February. Um, we also run a company called NFT Cred, which is trying to consumerize NFTs, the creation and distribution. And the reason we joined the EEA is because we see we have an opportunity to contribute to the standards, the TTI. And my question for you, Ron, is can you tell us a little bit more about what the EEA is doing with NFTs? And I just want to say to Hudson, about 20 years before you were in diapers, I was writing code on punch cards. Okay. Well, here's we have a winner. All right, so I was doing assembly code on a PDP-11 computer. <laughs> so, and so I was telling these guys, the, lang the two languages I learnt, knew back when in school was assembly, and then the other one was Fortran. Were you at Woodstock at the time? Oh, all right, I'll tell you a, a sad Woodstock story. I had this very cute girl I was dating at college. And no, 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 I got to tell you. And she invited me to go to Woodstock. This is the sad part. And it was raining, shitty weather. And I'm going, I, nobody knew back then, I was in New Jersey, what the heck it was going to be. I actually didn't go and I could have, so that really sucks. And I, but you're I, at DevCon, which is just as This cool. is a lot better. <laughs> I was really bummed. Anyway, so... <laughs> so now I forgot, the question is... 
Yeah, yeah NFTs, okay. So, uh, so bottom line, and this is, this is important for you guys to know, we're just like the Ethereum Foundation, the cat herders. We are, we're just, the, all we do is try to formalize, like everyone else does, the group of members who want to do something. So we have a few initiatives, and you're going to see an announcement very soon, and Jer that was Jeremy's idea way about a month or two ago. We have an initiative that actually there's Marley from Microsoft, and he helped. Um, and you're talking about what corporate does? This could have been a Microsoft initiative, but Microsoft approached us and said, look, we need to tokenize the whole ecosystem for interoperability, and we should make it neutral so everybody wants to jump in, so you have a, the common language like the language of music, you have notes and you have rules, but you can then, everybody can share and, 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 and participate. We're doing that in the EA. So the EA gets, rep, uh, we, we're hosting this initiative. And so there we invite everybody to participate, so for NFTs. But then we still want to push it on to the EA's uh, mainnet. And, and figure out how we tokenize um, in the right way for NFTs tied to the Ethereum mainnet. So we'll be launching about another month, another initiative, uh, a, a token working group that's focused on the Ethereum mainnet. So the bottom line is uh, Ethereum, as you mentioned, Ethereum Foundation members can participate. We publish all our specs publicly. So you don't have to be a member and to do it and, 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 uh, and see everything that we're doing and you can communicate with us. And that's why Paul joined. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. I so, question. oh, Tim, yeah. I guess this is more of a comment. Uh, so I'm Tim, I work on Hyperledger Base U, which is like in the interesting position of we have both a mainnet client and we do all this permission network stuff. Uh, so we kind of get to be on, on both of those calls um, and, and the discussion earlier around like, uh, you know, the EEA does work on a lot of initiatives that provide value, but to the core Ethereum community, it's kind of obscure and hard to see. Um, and, and I totally get that because I think people complain the same thing about core devs. Uh, they're like, you know, we just had a session earlier. People were like, oh, what's like the meta EEP or EIP1? And, and people just don't know. And, and, and it's, it's normal, like people don't have the time to find out those things. Uh, but one thing I think we do well on core devs that perhaps the EEA could, could consider is the meetings are kind of semi-open. So the meetings uh, on core devs get shared in Zoom. Uh, there's no password or anything, but if you kind of don't really belong there or contribute to the meeting, Hudson will kick you out very politely. I saw it once. Um, but any, anyone else can just join on YouTube and watch the live stream or read the transcript. Um, and I can see a kind of model like that working for the EA, maybe because of big company policies, you want to introduce some delay or something like that. You know, the specifics might be harder. Um, but where you have the members, you know, on the call being able to speak, but everybody else is able to listen or to get a transcript or notes. Uh, I think that helps a lot with transparency um, and, and, and would help with just like trust in the community that like there's not something shady happening in the meeting that you're not seeing. Yeah, actually a year ago in Prague, we had a controversy because we had these ad hoc meetings where some of the core devs got together and they um, were talking about ETH1X. And that's where the term was, was, uh, came from, was a year ago, ETH1X, and there was a bunch of people in a room and we were just talking about it. And then uh, someone wrote notes and uh, it was a, and then those notes got leaked, and it was like, whoa, there were these secret meetings, and so we got nervous, and so uh, CoinDesk and Cointelegraph and the others, sometimes they've been doing a really great job lately of getting it right, and we have direct connections with them, but um, back then, sometimes it was harder to get like the updates, because they'd listen to the core dev calls, then immediately put something out, and so uh, we felt like pressure to have this, we had this live YouTube call, people are watching us, so you can't say things like, yeah, Ethereum's not gonna be around in two years because of state bloat. <laughs> like literally state bloat's gonna take it so you can't even have it on an SSD. Like you can't say that because Coindesk is gonna be like Ethereum's doomed. So uh, what we did was we had, for one time we had Chatham House rule, Chat, Chatham? Chatham, Chatham House. House rules call, the, uh, the transcript was completely there, no one was attributed, and the call was not recorded. We tried that one time, and we got enough community backlash, we've never done it again. So that's something where you can't even go that far. You need to be completely open, or else you won't get accepted, in my opinion. So, so I wanted to look at some of the other ways that we do have a, a communication. I mean, why are we not on all core devs calls? Because all core devs is on that. As, as Paul showed, 
We build on top of the stack. We don't want to interfere with the stack. We don't want to change the stack. And as it develops, we want to make sure we're still compatible. So we'll chop stuff out of our stuff. You know, we'll change to fit with the overall Ethereum stack, because that's critical. We also have a policy if we, you know, for example, want a new opcode, if we want a new precompile, that we will publish that stuff and make sure that you know and get to see it and review it, and we will feed that in as EIPs before we do it. So far, we haven't actually gone there. You know, we, we've set this up and said that is how we will do anything that might come and touch you know, deeper into mainnet that might need feedback from core devs. We'll take it there and make sure we get that before we go there. <laughs> Uh, there are a couple of things happening where we might be doing that over the next, you know, six months or so. Um, so there are mechanisms which we have put in place, but not used because we haven't had a use case for them yet. There's, there's been nothing to say beyond, look, here's our spec, here's what we're doing. Just, just to reemphasize a couple of the things Hudson said, you know, the, this question of openness and transparency has been a contentious topic in the core dev community for it since I joined, so a couple years ago. And we've landed in a place which I think is a very good place, which is, as Hudson said, kind of complete openness and complete transparency. If there's one value that I think the, the participants and contributors in this process share, it is the value of openness and transparency. And I think that's a cultural difference between this community and kind of the more corporate side of the world. Uh, and so, like, again, having worked for a corporation before, like, I understand that there are sometimes legal reasons or other reasons why not everything can be totally open and participatory to everyone. But I do think that we need to do a much better job of communicating what those reasons are. And I would, like, just, again, representing myself and no one else, I would like to see, like, way more openness and transparency on the part of EEA and other folks, because I think that would, again, go a long way towards uh, removing some of the skepticism that we feel. Okay. All right, so my name is Michael, and uh, I, I do a lot of consulting in blockchain, but I was president of the blockchain club at UT Dallas. And at UT Dallas, we've had a lot of uh, blockchain stuff. Uh, recently, there's like professors are starting to do more research. The university is starting to recognize it as this is something we want to train students for. Uh, but we, we're currently on a rollout of pressure to focus on the right things. We're like, I've tried to make it clear, like, I think Ethereum is where we should be focusing, whether it's permissioned or public Ethereum. Uh, and then the local, the local corporations you have in Dallas right now are like IBM and uh, <coughs> Hedera Hashgraph. So, so we're currently in a situation where we're trying to educate university faculty on like this is where you should be focusing your efforts. So as well as trying to tell students this is also where you should be trying to like at least first start learning about blockchain before maybe you, you pick your stack of choice. So my question is what kind of educational resources or what are, what are ways to reach out where we can say, hey, here's, a, here's where you should look and see how you can start maybe contributing to the Ethereum community, uh, whether it's in the EEA or in the Ethereum Foundation. All I wanted to say was UTD is like ta University of Texas Dallas. They're one of the leaders in education blockchain stuff I visited. It's excellent. Um, secondly, as far as educational resources go, that is a big gap we have, I feel like. The EF needs to do a better job of that. Um, we have documentation efforts that are getting spun up a little bit, but I do want to hear other perspectives and maybe the EEA if there's, if there's things that are in the works for that. So yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, I, I'm reminded that in 1997, I was part of 2,000 people at the company I worked for uh, that were getting behind Java, this radical new technology that we were working on. That, and it was beautiful, it was open source, well, kind of open source. And well, we all got involved in somebody else's thing, which was kind of openness before open source. Um, and part of the thing I, I was involved with was getting the educational community involved in, in Java. And what was interesting was where those 2,000 people had no, there was no organization at my company called the Java organization at the time. There were 2,000 people that were self-organizing. When I think of corporations, I've spent half of my career starting stuff and the other half working in large groups of mostly humans uh, that we call corporations. And to me, from my perspective, they're really not a lot different. You've got people that need to work together and they need to work under some kind of operating principle and that gets ossified over time and we call that a corporation. Um, you know, Uber was the radical and now they're the bad guys, right? Well, they were, I guess they were always bad guys. But that's, <laughs> so, so the point is that it, it, it's, it, there's lots of educational resources, but the most important educational resources the resource is the one that shows the front door to people with initiative to say, I'm gonna, I, I see a spot. W with our 2,000 people with Java, 
we knew that we needed to make it work for, I'll call it serious business. I mean, it's not, you know, enterprise is a terrible word, really. I, I almost, I, I'm glad that it's EEA and not Enterprise Ethereum Alliance anymore. You know, it's kind of like KFC. Um, because if you're a four-person startup that's working in, in um, that's handling grandma's pension, you have the same problems as any enterprise does. If you're dealing with PII or HIPAA, you have the same problems. Dealing with those things and now doing it with the main, the main net as the center point, as the, met, as the bus, that's, um, that's gonna require a lot of serious work by people in corporations who understand that, not because they're part of that corporation, but because they're a person that understands how to do that kind of work. So we had to find this, the front door and show it really clearly and say, this is, you, know, you, you want to set something up? This is how you set it up. Just I, a quick I'm, no, oh, oh, sorry. I'm just going to talk about the academic. We have a, uh, we, we get approached by uh, uh, university schools all the time. So um, we have an academic partnership agreement and that will engage with universities, but I can share with you what I usually look at or what we look at is are they doing true research or they tr are really have something to contribute and then we can actually give them, and so you know that already happens, uh, Rice, we have, um, we have University of Penn, USC, and we'll even hold events at the schools. So if you have, an, you're from all over the world, if you have a, a university, that's why I'm bringing this up, that is doing research, the professors and then the folks working on stuff, um, they can approach us and join. They actually have complete visibility into everything that we do. And we'll look at some of the ideas you have. I think if we had a way where folks can see what we do, we are completely transparent. And maybe there's a way, I don't know the best way, but we, we're open to talking about how we okay. could do that. One, one thing, I, one theme I keep seeing here is that I believe that, that the EEA, like a big component of the EEA, has to do with the legalities because you're, it's, it's this notion about protecting from patent trolls. But also I think in order to engage with corporations, in order to engage with the corporate process, you have to comply, it's sort of conform to the legal frameworks that make the corporation possible. We say corporations are people, but corporations, a corporation is a person. It is, it, it is a person in the eyes of the law, and it has this incredible, huge amount of legal code protecting it and it's incorporated into the government, it has relationships with other corporations, and all of it is legal. And the EEA is a way to en enable them to collectively work together on, on technology and not kill each other, because they want to kill. Like, that's the way I see the corporation, it's out to get profit, and will do anything for that. So they have all this legal framework to control, to control and coordinate their behavior, and so, when, when you, like for example, you're working with the Ethereum Foundation. I don't know if most of the people who work at the Ethereum Foundation know this, but the members, uh, the people who, who are contractors at the Ethereum Foundation have an Ethereum Foundation email address, can now, are now covered in this legal framework. And so they can have access to, to this information, to these communications that lead to the, the output that is public, anyone can get that, right? What I'm interested in is this NFT, uh, the NFT group that I was talking to you about earlier. How many members is your group and how did you become a member? Can community organizations join and cover their people with this legal protection, I guess you'd call it, and then they can get access to this stuff? Because I call this the secret EIPs. Like to me, behind the legal veil of this, of, of, of the, the shielding, is I call it the secret EIPs. You guys have access to the secret EIPs. How did you? How did you do it? Like how? How is your? Could you tell us? I think you mean how many people are a member of NFT NYC? Yeah, and are they are they able to get in, into the EEA's like communi communications? Uh, Can I? Yeah, you better answer. But, but I want to ask one last. I want to answer one other question, which is. Last year, we had 120 speaker applications for NFT NYC, so a lot of the influencers came to us. And this year, we've only had speaker applications open for two weeks, and we've already had 60. So we're, we're getting a lot of the leaders and developers in the space coming to us because they want to be part of the event in February. 
Yeah, yeah just a quick answer. Um, any any entity, whether it's a corporate, any any anyone can join. But uh, if it's if, like your organization, it would be the management, if, if, as long as it's the email address. It's just like Ethereum Foundation, because that means they can form, like as you mentioned. And so, um, uh, so that's how we do it. But if all the 200 member companies, they would, um, w they would have to look at joining the EA, but his organization. Did he have, have to pay? Did they pay? Um, if we do, if, uh, it depends. You, you had, had to pay, pay something, but if we so you pay up, pay up the money, and you it's like face it's like really Facebook that you pay for. You have the email address, and now you're now you can get access to the secret EIPs. Well, yeah. So it's um, can I? <laughs> I don't know what secret EIPs, but maybe they're they're hiding it from me. Can I make myself Ethereum Foundation email and join you guys? Absolutely, if you can, because then you're represented by the Ethereum Foundation. Cool. Just, just, just circling back to the, the question, like I, I, this is also interesting and important. I just think like education is something we can do so, so, so much better. It's like arguably the most important thing we should be doing. And I want to propose that this is like a low-hanging fruit, obvious place where we can collaborate because like it's in everyone's interest that like people, you know, like you, students who want to like roll up their sleeves and learn about how to contribute to Ethereum and build on it can do that and access those resources. Like I've, I personally spent hours writing curriculums and giving lectures uh, at various universities, including my alma maters, like in a permissionless fashion. So like, let's collaborate on this. Just a comment here, sorry. So there's no secret EIPs, correct? If there is an EIP, the EVM, the current implementation of what the enterprise Ethereum clients use, they're based on the mainnet clients, and the Ethereum EVM there is the same VM. And if there's any modification to it, it would be through the public implementation. It wouldn't be through like a custom EIP or a secret EIP. The main thing of EA, I think you explained it earlier very well, which is basically a way for all of these enterprises to work together. But as soon as it's going to modify or enhance or update Ethereum public, that's when it goes through the public EIP. Yeah. Um, I had a kind of a comment. Um, so is IBM a member of the EEA? No. Oh, thank God. I was about to go on. Yeah, good. There were some um, strongly worded discussions around. We, we had this challenge when we were doing, I mean, Marley might want to talk about it, how to make the token taxonomy initiative um, open across industry, but not have, but have membership in the EA mean that you're endorsing it, meaning that you're part of the Ethereum community. Yeah, and that's the thing, because like, there's so many, there's hundreds of organizations, and if one of them's a bad apple, or multiple of them's a bad apple, then what happens? Like, what what happens with them figuring out, oh, Ethereum mainnet's not for me, or what happens with their influence? Because there's a lot of fear about corporate takeover amongst yeah, the crypto anarchists within absolutely. the EF and absolutely. the community. So, like, what would be done in that situation, or so, how is that being prevented right so, now? So we have a corporate structure that, like, binds them to behave in certain ways, but, as Jamie yeah. said. So there's a membership agreement, and it's like it would, and they have to sign. They can't come in, and if one company was doing something that was a bad actor, there we would it would go to the board. But if we could show evidence of it, so for example, we've had some. We had one member who, who uh, it was an ICO, and, and they were not. The, they were the shade a shady member. So we went ahead. We took it to the board, and we kicked them out. Because uh, we don't want dishonest entities to be in the org, so there, that's some of the benefits you have w with through an, a, an association and industry org. Sure, audience questions, please. Does the Ethereum Foundation or the EEA have uh, American tax status as a nonprofit organization? As far as the um, Ethereum Foundation goes, we do not have an American entity. We have a Swiss entity. Well, okay, it's very complicated, but we basically have a Swiss entity, a German entity, and a Singapore entity. Okay. And EA is a 501c6, so we're a nonprofit. Right. So you, you actually, um, do you have, as a trade organization, you have to have a common purpose, um, and then you can't uh, self deal. No, we can't. We get asked by even folks joining, uh, can we have any affiliates or political? Um, and we have to sign off that we cannot and we don't. Yeah. So, no, we're, we're safe. <laughs> okay. And do you, do you have an educational component as part of that trade organization? I mean, usually, usually there's one of the things the IRS looks at is 
um, are you doing enough from an education standpoint as a trade organization to achieve your common mission? Um, this is important for the crypto anarchists because uh, one of the release valves you have, just like you can fork an open source project, is you can challenge um, under US tax law and go to the IRS and, and call them out for bad behavior um, if you think they're not achieving their intended goals. Yeah, uh, we're not in the US. I feel like we're safe, but uh, I am not a lawyer. <laughs> oh yeah, you are. <laughs> and actually, so I think we're, we're a little past time, so you might be the last question. Is that accurate? Are we a little? Oh, it's okay to keep it going? All right, I'm not familiar with this format. Let's keep the, this session till yeah. like 12, so we can go on a lunch afterwards together. Okay. Now that he knows that I'm a lawyer, he only wants to have one question left. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it makes sense. Uh, my question is, so since you're having a paid membership, how is the structure looking like? Is, uh, is it that each member gets a voting right, so it's one member, one vote, or do you have a pondering system, or how is the governance looking like? Governance is as equal opportunity as you can get, whether you pay. Our least expensive membership is $3,000. We even put it on payments it's because we want the smaller companies to participate, or members could be. So one, one membership, one vote, regardless of the size of the company. So everyone gets an equal say. Uh, when we uh, look at the pages of the tech group uh, on EEA website, uh, DID is the first item. DID, uh, decentralized identity, is the first item uh, on it. Uh, this is, uh, is also our interest, interested topic. Uh, so I have some questions on uh, DID. So uh, from EEA, uh, EEA side, uh, in uh, enterprise blockchain scenario, uh, what uh, is the benefit uh, DID can provide? Uh, can I uh, can I explain my question clearly? Yes, please. Uh, so my first question is, uh, uh, what? The ID can provide what a benefit can the ID system provide in enterprise uh, blockchain scenario, uh, and uh, what is the DID the uh, ID standard plan? Uh, I, I think I can answer some of that. Do you want me, or, or do you have more, or do you? Was that your question? Um, so, so there there are a couple of interesting pieces into in your question. Um, one is what is what is from the EEA or from an, a, a business perspective, what is identity all about? And, you know how is that going to go forward? And gosh, you know I, I sure wish it would go forward faster. That's all I'd like. Um, but the the important thing is that I was sitting next to by chance the 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 um, Secretary of State for the state of Delaware a few years ago at a, at a dinner, and I, I leaned over and I asked him. I said, how many companies are registered in Delaware? who are controlled by, say, one person, but you don't know. And he said, I don't know, but it's a lot. So there's, a, you know, there's an individual self-sovereign identity question. And then there's, how do I know that the company I'm dealing with on a blockchain, on an open, especially mainnet, um, how do I know that that's not, a, that's not only the bona fide company, but it's the only bona fide company and that I'm not accidentally dealing with some other company or some other entity. This is a deep problem, and it's one that I think the EEA is equipped to, to, to deal with as identity uh, uh, matures. Identity has not matured along any lines as fast as I sure would like to see it, and I see some friends in the audience would agree. But there's a lot of people diligently working on it, and I think that corporate identity and individual identity have a relationship that um, is it could be radical how we, how we uh, how we approach that if we do it right, and, and I think we have to. We'll have a lot of work to do on that. I'd love to um, so I, identity is probably the most complicated challenge because it's subjective as well as objective. And if you look at what um, companies want, and then for uh, and others who are involved in social impact, 
they're apples and oranges. It's very challenging. Uh, our view, what I'm seeing is there are, there's enough organizations out there focused on identity DIF. I was at the ID2020 event. Um, uh, so I think that the only way any one uh, organization is going to, to drive identity isn't going to happen. And so I think our, our, our objective is to really track what goes on and then come up with a way, uh, hopefully in the future, I, the same way we're looking at tokens, which we, I, I believe this is where we're focused on. We're doing a good job on uh, unifying the language of tokens. I think the identity side is, is going to be uh, far more challenging. So we don't really know yet, so to answer your question. Uh, it's up to what our members would like to see us do. So, so I want to try and distill John's answer. The use of, of identifiers in enterprise blockchains is because you want to know who else is on the chain, right? We, we need to have ways of saying, I've set up a consortium. I want to know, you know what this consortium's members are. It's tied up with permissioning. In terms of the what is the standards path for decentralized identifiers? Dan Burnett, who's sitting over there, chairs W3C's Distributed Ident Decentralized Identifiers Working Group, which is a standards path for building a proper infrastructure to do them. So he's probably a good person to ask. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I, I didn't know what decentralized identity meant for the EEA. I would like to understand that, actually. Um, but the W3C has recently formed a decentralized identifier working group, and that is, uh, that is a technology piece which can be used for a variety of, uh, of purposes, one of which could be building an identity system, but it was very, 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 very specifically created as an identifier only um, so that it can be used in systems where you do not have to define identity. And I'm happy to talk with anyone who would like to understand uh, what some of those alternatives might be. Any other questions from the audience? Just come over here. OK, great. OK, hello, everybody. Hello. Um, my name is Jose. I feel part of the Ethereum community since 2016. Um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you if you are uh, thinking about some kind of credential that maybe uh, people from the community can have in order to, to yeah, you, to, to not just feel part of the Ethereum community, but actually be part of the Ethereum community, maybe an NFT or something. I read that in the DEF CON, they will give an NFT of an attendance, but maybe for the people that couldn't come, that they can also be like a certified Ethereum community person that can maybe represent them directly or something. Please, nobody can listen to you. Just, if you will hold the mic, please hold it tight to your mouth so people can hear you. So just for everyone's benefit, does someone have the Pope sticker, the POAP sticker? I see some people like Santi, you're here. Can you stand up and model it? This the sticker you have right here? PO, the Pope sticker. Yeah, so, so this is a sticker that um, everyone should have gotten a check-in if you didn't like go there and ask for it. And it's actually attached to an NFT token. This is maybe what you were referring to. And there's um, a couple of folks who developed this Pope protocol. Pope stands for Proof of Attendance Protocol and have been handing them out at Ethereum events around the world for the past couple of years. So it's really cool if you have wallet software, you can sort of collect these tokens. To the second piece of your question, my feeling personally is no, we don't want credentials because we want this to be an open community that like actually the way you began your question, you said, if I, if I heard you correctly, you said, I feel that I've been a member of the Ethereum community since 2016. Is that, that's sort of what you said, right? Yeah. That's how it should be from my perspective. You shouldn't need a credential or, or, or a badge or something to prove that you're part of this community. It should be a community that anybody who feels a strong affiliation with or an affinity with uh, and wants to assert their membership can kind of stand up and say, I'm an Ethereum, I'm a member of the community. That's, that's my feeling. I feel like you may have a thought on this. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I, wa I want to preserve privacy. So there can, I would say that there should be people who can generate an identity if they want to. But it, I think identity is really important. I think, it's, I think it's a key, otherwise it's going to be monopolized. And identity is on its way to being monopolized. And I think the EEA actually has a big opportunity here to coordinate with all the corporations who have users, who have people that can be identified for very good reasons, and then to create this open standard. Um, DID is a great open standard. And what, what you're describing, DID is actually a really good um, way, way to go. 
And um, I, what implementations on Ethereum are there for DIT? I don't know. Um, I believe there is Yujo EIP, Music EIP, had. There's an EIP. Oh, okay. Uh, with uh, smart smart contract based accounts EIP. I don't remember the number. I think Fabian Vogelsteller was the author of it. Seven twenty five. Uh, seven. 725. 725. So look into EIP 725 as well. Okay. Definitely. Identity is, is, is a thing for the age of, of convergence. It was not something that the age of divergence was going to work. Jim, you got one? Well, I, I say it because I come from Colombia, and we have made uh, several uh, meetups there. But uh, we always say that we feel part of the community. But maybe if there were some kind of credential, uh, maybe we could gather more people because they can see some kind of legitimacy behind it. And yeah. it's just not people that feel community and want to talk. Thank you. Uh, Jim Zan, uh, co-founder of Kaleido, which is active member of EEA, uh, the technical working group. Uh, I'd like to address the, the question about the IDs and corporate identities. So I think there's there's. The idea as a technology came out, uh, I guess, three years ago. Uh, the first time I heard of that term was when uh, Chris, can't remember his, his last name, was working with uh, 2020, uh, the, the uh, UN project, where you can trust any centralized identity to be the, the only source of truth for your personal identity. That's not going to work in many of the world's uh, situations. So that's where the DID idea came out of, that you, you, the only way to preserve your identity is to make it not a, a thing that a single organization holds. But I think in the corporate world, it's quite different because corporate identities as a legal thing does not exist unless it's been, um, what's the right word, stamped by government, right? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so, but I think it's generally the case that um, you have to be rec recognized under certain legal system, which means if you want to find out who is responsibility, who's responsibility of um, uh, certain uh, corporate actions lies, you need to go to a registry and find out, right? Which means by nature, this is a centralized thing. So with Clyda, what we're taking is a, 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 uh, a practical approach where what are the problems we can solve today that enterprises that are joining together to a consortium are facing and they need to solve it today versus the idea, it's, just, it's a very exciting uh, idea, but it takes, it's going to take some time to, to actually be useful and, and be, um, uh, be realized, right? So today, there is a very good system, very robust, that everybody is relying on. That's PKI. Uh, if, if you talk to any um, uh, enterprise in any form of shape, right, you log on to Facebook or you go to Bank of America to try to log on to your uh, banking system, you are dealing with that system. You're trusting that. And that is what's making the, the, the world work today. So why don't we take advantage of that system and solve the, the, the corporate identity uh, problem today and then have a uh, view on the future with DIDs? It, so Jim, that's the approach we're taking. And we're making um, uh, proposals to the, the uh, spec, uh, technical spec, to make this be part of the, the next version. It, so. Jim and Mr. Burnett, would, would, you, would you guys say that there's a stackability opportunity here? A little bit longer term than immediately today, but as an individual, I should have my own self-sovereign identity. But then when I join a company, if I do that, but you know, of course we're gonna kill all those pretty soon, but, but while they still exist, um, uh, or you know, some group of humans, um, I should be able to stack, like, like ENS could, right? I can say, oh, now I'm gonna attach a, an identity on top of that, and when I get fired, which inevitably will, will happen, uh, you know, the, I'm gonna, it'll snap on, off the top, but I still have my core identity underneath that I don't lose. Um, is, that, is that sort of where the architecture is gonna go, so that you have both individual identity and... Yeah. Yes, there's definitely individual identities and corporate identities. So again, uh, the ID came out of the idea that indiv individual identity should be protected in the decentralized system, which I think is, again, uh, quite different from the corporate side. Right. Last question. Last question. 
Um, so actually, I was just going to respond to what um, to what you said. So identity. Um, Identity means very different things to different people, and that is the problem. I hate the word identity. I absolutely despise it, because when you say identity, you know what you mean, but it is ab I can guarantee you it's not what I mean. One of the most influential papers I read was uh, from a workshop called Rebooting the Web of Trust on the five mental models of identity, because it was just an attempt to point out, and there are more models than that, but, but it was an attempt to point out that um, what you mean by identity when you're talking about allowing someone on a plane is different from what you mean by identity if you're just talking about whether um, an individual or uh, whether um, an entity making use of services online is permitted to do that. Okay? They may be completely different. In the first case, you have a physical security issue and you need to know that that physical person is not getting on the plane. In the second case, Maybe you don't need any of that, and in fact, maybe it's way better for no identifying inf information to be made available, okay? And the problem with the word identity is that it leads people to think there is one notion of identity. And even if you say, no, you can have multiple identities, then there's still the question of who defines what that identity is, and I think there's a, there's a mental mistake in that. So you're right that the, the, decent, the verifiable credentials and decentralized identifier-based approach, those two can work together, will take a while to, to get out there. And so what people should do in the meantime, there are a variety of identity-based approaches today. Um, use whatever works for you. I'm not gonna take time right now to go into um, the reasons why verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers were created. Um, it's because of failures that we saw with other approaches um, that all tried to define identity as a, as a unified thing. So obviously it's a big conversation. No one knows exactly what it, what it means or what it should mean. And going forward, we'll just have to see uh, where things go. But um, you know, I have my own opinions like others. Just a, a pragmatic point about that for, sorry, York wrote from Microsoft. Um, and we were involved in uh, co-founding the Decentralized Identity Foundation, which is a associate member of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, specifically because we can see the collaborations between those organizations. Um, the pragmatic approach is, and this is I think where John was going, is that if an enterprise is to do business with another enterprise on the mainnet, it has to somehow be able to verify that that digital thing at the other end is actually that enterprise. And so this methodology around DIDs and verifiable claims is actually a really good way to do that in a way that doesn't rely on the trust of a single organization. And so that is, in a pragmatic way, something that in the short term we actually are, you know, we need to look at that. And it's something that's solvable today with the technology that exists. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending this session.